Good morning, everybody. Good to have you all joining us in church today. Good to have you joining us online. We welcome you. I uh, want to share some announcements. One, the uh, April newsletter is available at the back of the church where it is available online. You can pick it up or check it out. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to have a volunteer fair. It's in the library and maybe in other rooms too, but it's certainly in the library where you'll have the opportunity to find out about different ministries that are occurring in the church. Also, at the Journey Cafe, we've started the Journey Church um, first Sunday of the new year. And it's been going along, and today we're trying to ramp it up. And there's a breakfast out in the sidewalk, and uh, people can come and eat, and hopefully we'll entice them to come in and we'll engage with people. And uh, at least half of the people who have gone to the Journey Cafe so far have not been people that typically have attended church. And our target is young adults. So it's, it's going pretty well. Uh, in the Sunday School Hour today, we have Britaskic Bash that uh, Jen is leading with other volunteers. And we're going to have a lot of fun during the Sunday School Hour, not for any of us in this room except for those little ones over there, I think. Uh, but we're going to have a good time. And then there's lunch or a meal afterwards, and we're inviting uh, families. Hopefully families will come and participate in that. This afternoon at 3 to 7 o'clock, I'm having a new membership class. And if anyone wants to join me and join the church, but join me for that event, we'll be at the Journey Cafe. And also uh, want to mention that Mylon and Jean's 60th wedding anniversary is occurring this, Friday, this Thursday, April 11th, married uh, 60 years. So congratulations to them. <laughs> and finally, last, not, uh, last week, Emma Klein was in church and then died on Sunday. And so we extend our sympathies to her family. She had some cardiac issue and uh, so we extend our sympathies to those family, that family. Her flowers are here inside of me. So having shared all of those announcements, let's bow for a word of prayer as we prepare to worship the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your love and for the presence of your Holy Spirit among us and in our lives throughout the week. And we pray that you would continue to work in us and through us to advance your kingdom and serve you. And if we come together to worship you this morning, we pray that you would you just draw us near to yourself and we would be caught up in authentic worship and praise of your holy name. We love you, we adore you, we praise you for all the blessings of life and for the opportunity to gather today. In your name we pray, amen. Let's stand and say hello to the person near us as we prepare to worship the Lord. Let's come together now and sing hymn number 233, The Strife is O'er, The Battle Done. 233.
let's confess our sins using the confession that's printed on the screen. Heavenly Father, some of our sins are obvious to us. Others are obvious to others. Others are well known both, and still others are known only to you because we tend to be blind and in denial. Whatever their common knowledge or lack thereof, we ask for your pardon and your cleansing. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, uh, just thank you for your love for us. And uh, I was going around the church before uh, service started and talking to people. How was your week? And some of us, maybe many of us, don't even remember the details of the week. And in a similar way, when we made this confession, read this confession, there's some sins that are known only to you because we tend to be blind and in denial or just simply forget. Help us to be more reflective and help us to be more aware of those times when we fall short and displease you. Sometimes the words, the thoughts, the actions just come so automatically that we, we lack uh, the kind of self-control we really should have. We confess you, confess to you the lack of self-control and, and the lack of conscientious effort empowered by your Holy Spirit to change. Thank you for your forgiving love and help us to be increasingly like your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I wanna share the scripture lessons from this morning. It's uh, book of Exodus chapter three, verses one to 12. That's where I'm reading, Exodus chapter three, verses one to 12, if you wanna follow along says this, one day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in, ama in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go to see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. Here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers, yet I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the land of the people of Israel, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you brought, have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. This ends the reading of God's holy word.
Please be seated. So I, I was upstairs. We have, we have three grandchildren with us this weekend, Aaron's children. And um, for some reason, I was upstairs in a hallway outside the one bathroom. And we have pictures in the walls up there and, and tour from my grandparents' estate when they had their auction. We bought these pictures and they're relatives of mine. I look so much similar to them. Oh, shucks, I forgot to show the video. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll skip that for today, okay? Um, or maybe play it after. Maybe we'll play it after the sermon. Give them something to think about. That's what we'll do. But anyway, I was standing outside the bathroom, and, and two of the pictures are pictures of my great, great, great uncle, somebody who knows who, and it kind of looks similar to me. And then in the middle is a picture Meredith drew of herself, pencil sketch, very nice pencil sketch of herself when she was a senior in high school, and I noticed the, the date. She wrote her name at the bottom, you know, like an artist would, and 98. Meredith graduated from high school in 98. You, need, you know what that means. Meredith's out of high school for 26 years, I told Deanna. When your daughter's out of high school for 26 years, that can only mean one thing. You're getting old, man. You're getting old. Here. Yeah, right. So I'm going to retire sometime. The church is going to tell me when. I don't know when. But people will ask me, what, what's the one question that you think people are now asking me? What are you going to do when you retire? That's one. There may be other questions like hurry up already, but it might be another. But one question is, what, what are you going to do when you retire? You know what I'm going to do when I retire? Anything I want. <laughs> Anything I want. I'll spend more time with my grandchildren, although one weekend's enough. We'll see them in a couple months. But I'll, I, yeah, I'm going to spend more time with grandchildren. I'll, I'll uh, work my workshop. I'll travel. We'll travel. I will. I'm thinking of, I have lots of thoughts in my head. Lots of thoughts. Like, I'm thinking of hiking the Appalachian Trail. Does that sound like fun? Yeah, no, yeah, no. I, I, or I'm not sure I like rattlesnakes that I might encounter. So I'm thinking of walking across the United States. I think that would be wild to do. And I might do that. I've read a book about that already. I could do that. I've thought of learning to play the saxophone, the tenor saxophone. I just, th I just think I'd like to learn to play. I'm not going to do all these things. I can't, I can't do all these things. But I, I'm, like, I aspire to do some of these things. Something else I've wanted to do for a, a number of years, I really would like to do, but I just think it just sounds like too much work, but I, I've thought of it already, is, is this. I would like to, I, I'm interested in biographies, so I like to read biographies, I really love people, and, and I'm thinking maybe I could become a character, like a historic figure, and spend whatever money it requires to get a costume that makes me look like somebody in history and, and, and make up and the whole deal. And then I'd like to go into schools and do assemblies for elementary school. And I'd like to be this historic character and, and talk in the assembly about my life in that setting as that historic character. And it would take it over the top if the person also had some faith dimensions that every now and then I could slip into the mix authentically. And then I, I'd go to the cafeteria and eat lunch. We eat like this historic figure, eat. doesn't that sound fun? That sounds fun. Now, it also sounds like, doesn't it sound like a little bit of work? Yes, it does. So I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm going to do that. Or, or I could get a job. Yeah, I could get a job. I could drive a school bus. Or I could, uh, I would like to work at a, what? No? No? Well, I don't care. That's not, uh, or I could work at an amusement park. I've kind of thought of that would be fun. If I did, I'd like to run some children's rides at Knoebels, like children's rides, because I'd like to, I just like children, you know, I'd like to do that. So those are some of the things that I'm thinking about. But you know what? So those are some things I'm considering. I might not do any of those things, but I'll tell you, you know what I'm not going to do? You know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to volunteer anymore. I'm going to go to church, and then I'm going to go home, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do nothing. And I've been waiting for a long time to be able to say this, it's time for the younger people to take over. I'm not going to do a stinking thing. How does that sound? How does that sound to God? God, give me a thumbs up? Thumbs down? So you don't think I should say that? 
Then how come some of you say that? Ah! See, see, here's the deal. If you think it's wrong for me to retire and not do anything anymore, then isn't it also wrong for you? Uh, let me say that again, because I didn't hear any response to that question. If it's wrong for me to retire and not do nothing except go to church, go home, and do nothing else in service of God, is that wrong for me? Is that wrong for you? Ah, ah. I don't like this sermon so far, do you? <laughs> I don't like it. It's like, like I, don't, I don't like this sermon so far. It's just not, it's just not... It's just not right. You know what I mean? So here's where I want to go this morning. I want to talk about somebody. Uh, I want to talk about somebody that could relate to what I'm saying. But before I do, I want to read a scripture from the book of Romans, the chap- chapter 12, verses 6 to 8. Listen to this. This is 6 to 8. This is, is it, oh, before I do this, let me tell you something that people do. People like to volunteer sometimes. Everybody here, I'm sure, has volunteered sometimes. Like, Jen has some people, brick taskets downstairs. Do you have any volunteers helping you out down there? Did you, how, how many, did you ask any extra people to help you out? And you know what people do? Extra people to say, sure, I'll help you out this one time. That's called, you know, there's a word for that. You know what it's called? Drive-by volunteering. Like, I, I, yeah, I'll help you. Or, or Z World, we'll have Z World, right? And we have the, uh, some slides or whatever. And, hey, can you help us? Like, we have an activity time at 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock and then Sunday after at 11 o'clock. And then some people will say to us, I, I can help at the 3 o'clock Saturday slot, but I can't help at 5 o'clock. I can't help Sunday because we're going. That's called dry. Yeah, I can help. I can help then, but I can't help over the long haul. I can't, I, I'll help for this event here today, but I won't, I can't, I w- that's called drive-by volunteering. And, and there's a place for drive-by volunteering. There is a place for that, and I'll talk about that later, not now. But let me tell you something about drive-by volunteering. It's not biblical. It's not biblical. Drive-by volunteering is not biblical. It's good. We need drive-by volunteers. We, we function with drive-by volunteers. But the idea of drive-by volunteering is not a biblical concept. Here's what is a biblical concept in Romans chapter 12, verse 6. It says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts to do certain things well. Stop. Do you believe that? God has given us. Who's included in the us? All of us. God has given us the ability to do certain things well. That's true. That's true. All of us. Not, nobody, there's no exceptions. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. Like you, your thing is you've been given the gift to prophesy. You, you should prophesy, right? And then it goes on. He says, if your gift is serving others, then you should serve them well. And if you are a teacher, you should teach well. And if your gift is to encourage others, then you should be encouraging. And if it is giving, you should give generously. And if God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Like, what it's saying is your identity is linked to what you do. That's a dimension of your identity. If your identity, if you're able to prophesy, whatever that is, you should do it. It should be part of, you shouldn't occasion, it shouldn't be like a drive-by prophesy event. Best illustration would be teaching. If you, if you have a gift to teach, you shouldn't say to Jen, yeah, I'll fill in this time. That's not it. That's not biblical. That's drive-by teaching. If your gift is teaching, you're supposed to teach with regularity. For example, this is what the scripture says in, in 1 Corinthians. It also talks about gifting and that kind of thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. says, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. So there's many parts to our human body, and those, the totality of those parts makes the whole thing up, right? So this is my hand, right? 
Th this hand is a hand. That's what it is, right? Its identity is linked to the fact that it's a hand. And my foot is a foot. My foot is a foot. And it's linked, its identity is linked to its being footy. And my hand is linked to its identity being handy. The hand does handy things and the foot does footy things. That's how it works. It's not like, you know what, I have use for a hand right now. Would you mind volunteering? Sure, I'll volunteer. <laughs> I'll volunteer. And then it's, it's like a drive-by volunteer hand. Yeah, I'll help you today. And then after, after I'm done, my, my hand gets put on a shelf over here and I don't see it again. I don't stew it again for the next six months. And then my hand comes out of hiding and does handy things again. That's how it works. That's, that doesn't make any sense, right? My hand is, is a hand, and it's a hand right now in this moment, and it's always a hand. It's always a hand, and my foot is always a foot, and my, always, my foot is actively engaged and continually being a foot. It doesn't say, I'm going to take some time off being a foot. My, hands, uh, my foot's identity is linked to its footiness, and my hand's identity is linked to its handiness. That is what my hand is. My hand is a hand, and my foot is a foot. And if you have the gift of prophecy, you are called to be a prophet. And if you have the gift of teaching, you're called to be a teacher. And it's not like, yeah, I can help you next Sunday filling in if you need help. It's no, it's not like that. And the idea of a drive-by role is not biblical. You won't find it anywhere. Now, there is a place for drive-by volunteering. We function on drive-by volunteering. But this is... This is the teaching of God's word. And so here's what's going to happen when I retire. When I retire, you're not paying me anymore, right? Unless you want to. I'm, 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 I'm not objecting, but I don't think I'm going to get paid anymore. So when I retire, I'm not getting paid anymore. And you know what? I still have to serve. Why do I have to serve? Because God's word says I have to serve. God's word says that we're all called to serve. That was what was in that other passage of scripture from Romans. It says in Romans, where was it? Romans 12, 6. It says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. That includes me. I have to serve. If I am gifted in a particular way, I have to continue to use that gift for God's glory. Now, I could be more selective in my retirement, I don't have to do all the things I don't, uh, I, I don't, I, I currently have to do. I have to do some things today because I'm paid to do these things and I don't like everything I do here. But there's some things that I'm gifted in and those things I'm required to continue to do. That's what the scripture says. I could be more selective, but I continue to need to serve. Again, do you like the sermon so far? Here's, it's pretty simple. Like, my hand is a hand, my foot is a foot, my hand doesn't get to take time off, nor does my foot. My foot, is, my foot is a foot today, and it's also a foot tomorrow. That's its identity. And your giftedness is your identity, and you don't get to take any time off. And everybody here, without exception, is gifted and called by God to serve him consistently. Consistently. Now, it doesn't always necessarily, next week we're going to have a a, sh a fair over there, a, you know, a volunteer fair kind of thing, and you can find out some things done in the church, but here's the problem with that fair. There's not nearly enough jobs for everybody. That's the problem with the fair. Oh, they need more volunteers. But if everybody volunteered to the degree that we're all supposed to be volunteering by God, by his command, there's not nearly enough things for us to emb embody you to do. So if, for example... I were to become a historic character, and if I somehow was able to get into schools and put on assemblies, I would try to figure out a way to work in the faith element of that. And I may not be able to do it in schools, but I may say, hey, I'm here in the school, and tonight I'll be at a church telling you about another dimension of this, this particular historic character, wherever I might go. See, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my giftedness for God, and it may not even be within the context of the church, but we are all called by God to serve him and not just serve and volunteer. There's a lot of service opportunities we have in the community, but we have to, as Christians, serve in the name of God. Not just do good things, but serve in the name of God. And again, that passage of scripture used the word all. All. Now, let me get to a biblical example. And the guy that I want to talk about is Moses. Okay, so here's his story. Here's how Moses' story begins. 
Moses was born a slave. He was part of slave community. All the Hebrew people, all the Jewish people were in ancient Egypt and they were slaves. And they probably built the pyramids and that kind of thing. They built things out of brick and so on. And they were slaves. Moses was a slave. But these slaves, the population of slaves was increasing and the, the Egyptian system was getting worried, like maybe there's going to be an uprising. We can't have that happen. Let's, let's lessen the number of males that are going to fight and have an uprising. Let's lessen those numbers. Let's kill off all the baby boys under the age of two. <gasps> Moses was just born. His mother was concerned, got an idea. Let's make a basket, make it covered with tar or something so it's water uh, impermeable and, and let's put it in the Nile River and trust God to take care of him. Sure enough, God does and he floats down the river downstream and there's Pharaoh's daughter is out there and she sees Moses and says, oh, what a cute baby. She would have done the same thing with me because I was incredibly cute as a baby and continued to stay. But she, she grabbed him out of the basket and says, what a cute little baby boy. I think I'll... And then Miriam, his sister, is watching and she's saying, hey, I have an idea if somebody can nurse this baby boy. And, and Pharaoh's daughter says, hey, that'd be cool. So Pharaoh's daughter adopts the baby and the person who nurses the baby is Moses' own mother. It's God's provision. Great. Then what happens to Moses? Eventually he stops nursing. Now he's raised in the household of Pharaoh, the daughter, and so on. And Moses learns to speak Egyptian. And he learns Egypt, the Egyptian political system and how it works. And he knows the, the, the personalities of the individuals in the political system of the Egyptians. And he learns about their culture and their music and their arts. And he learns, like, he knows the Egyptian system, culture, ideas, everything, through and through. If for all practical purposes, Moses becomes Egyptian, but it is, is at his core Jewish. Then one day Moses, as an adult, goes out and he sees some of these Egyptian slave masters beaten up on the Jewish people. And he sees a particular guy, a nasty guy, beaten up, a Jewish person abusing the Jewish slaves, and when nobody's looking, Moses has a moment of righteous indignation. His anger is boiling because he's upset about the injustice that he sees happening right in front of his eyes. And this courageous anger wells up within him and he takes justice into his own hands and he kills the Egyptian that's beating up on the Jewish person and then buries him in the sand to cover up the offense because he doesn't want to get in any trouble. There's this, this holy anger inside of Moses. The next day he comes out and he's watching the Hebrew slash Jewish people again and he sees these two Jewish guys who are brothers in their faith fighting with each other and he says, what are you people doing? You shouldn't be fighting with each other. You're brothers in the faith. And, and the one guy wises off and says to Moses, what are you going to do, Want to kill us like you did the other guy the, yesterday? And all of a sudden, Moses thinks, why? These guys weren't even there. They didn't see it. That word is spreading about what I did. This is scary. And Moses, he leaves town. He goes to Midian, the land of Midian. And he's looking to establish a new life. And he finds it. He runs into his future father-in-law and his future wife, his, uh, whose name is Zipporah. Zipporah. Have anybody ever heard of Zippo lights, like if you smoke a cigarette, she invented them. Zippo lights, Zipporah. That's Zipporah. That's what Zipporah's claim to fame is. He didn't know that before because he didn't learn this. So anyway, Zipporah and Moses get married and they have a couple of sons and now life is moving forward. Moses is going to inherit the family business. He's working for his father-in-law, Jethro. He's tending sheep and all that kind of thing. And he's, 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 it's just nice. The boys are into soccer, and they got soccer practice to take to, and he, he's got an income stream, and it's just settled down. It's just settled down. It's comfortable. It's nice. It's good. It's, it's just, you know what? His life looks, his life kind of looks like our lives look. It's just settled in. And then this one day, well, let me pick up the story. I'm going to read from the book of Exodus just a little bit. It says this third chapter. It says, one day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro the priest of Midian. And he led the flock 
far into the wilderness. Like, he went, he went way out in the boonies. He went way out in the boonies with the flock. And, and they went to Sinai, the mountain of God. And there, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. And Moses stared at it in amazement. And although the bush was engulfed with flames, it didn't burn up. And Moses like, whoa. Whoa. I can't believe what I'm seeing. And then what happens next? Well, we read about it a minute ago, a couple minutes ago. God begins to speak to Moses from the burning bush. How many of us would like a burning bush experience? Like, hey, that'd be cool, right? Everybody, oh, I wish I, whoa, I wish I had an experience where God showed up and like wowed me. That would really be cool. Take off your shoes, you're standing on holy ground, like a burning bush and a voice coming out of a bush. Like everybody here would, would love to have that kind of experience. Well, here's what happened to Moses. He had that kind of experience. He had a burning, he had a burning bush experience and God spoke to him and God said, Moses, uh, actually a deeper voice, Moses, God has a deep voice. Moses, I want you to lead my people of Israel out of Egypt into freedom. Stop. Why would God ask Moses to do something like that? Why would God say, you know what? Moses, you're the man. Why would God say, Moses, you're the man? Why would he say that? What credentials did Moses have to do this job? Can you think about any? Like Moses knew the Egyptian culture inside and out. He knew everything. He knew the, the Egyptian language. He knew the art. He knew music. He knew the personality. He knew how the political system he He knew everything. He knew, he knew which like, uh, chains to pull. And he, he knew how to pull the ropes. He knew everything. Not only that, but he still was a, connected to his Jewish identity, his Hebrew identity. He, he cared about his Hebrew people, and he had a, se a sense of justice. Like, this is not right. What's being done to the people of Israel is wrong. He felt that within the core of his being, just like God was offended by the way his people were being treated, Moses felt the same way, and he had a righteous indignation about him and a, a desire for justice and a, a courage to, to step up and do what needed to be done to make things right. That was Moses. He had an Egyptian idea of, of what life was like within the framework of Egyptian life, and he had a passion for justice, and so God says, Moses, you're my man. Just like God knows each and every one of us, inside and out, each and every one of us, and God says, I have a job for you to do. Everybody. Without exception. Do I need to go back and read that other scripture from the, wherever it was, Romans 12, verse 6 to 8, where it says everybody has to serve? Everybody. And this includes Moses. And Moses is like, God is calling Moses. Moses, I got, hey, God puts his arm around Moses through the burning bush and says, Moses, you're the man. you the man. You know the Egyptian stuff. You, you have a passion for justice. And, and I'm going to use you to lead the people out of Egypt. So what does Moses do? He drags his feet, right? Drags his feet. So I'm going to read the foot dragging. You can count how many times Moses protested. Here we go. So God says, here's what I'm going to do. And then it says in chapter 3, verse 11, but Moses protested God. Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? That's a typical move when anybody is asked to volunteer. I, 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 I couldn't do that, right? Anybody ever, think, anybody ever think that of yourself? I couldn't do that. Huh? Anybody ever think that? Are we awake here? Or is this too early or what? Come on now, we didn't just change the clocks here. Well, I could never do that, right? I could never do that. Liar, liar, your pants are on fire, my mother used to say. And then God says, ah, I'm not buying that one. Then Moses, but Moses, number two, Moses protested. If, 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 if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to, to you, they will ask, what is his name? What should I tell them? In other words, they're going to question my spirituality. I'm not spiritual enough. I'm not knowledgeable enough about God. I don't even know God's name. Anybody here ever think you don't know about, enough about the Bible to do whatever you're being asked to do? Anybody ever think, anybody ever think that? 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know enough. I'm not spiritual enough. I'm not far enough down the road. Maybe when I get further down the road then, but not right now. I'm not ready yet. That's what it says. So he protested. Chapter 4, verse 1. But, but Moses protested again. What if they don't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? What if they don't believe my burning bush experience? What if they don't believe it? What if they don't believe that I should, what if nobody sees that I should have this role? It, 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 now he's protested three times. I don't know if I skipped any or not in the scripture, I forget. I just, these are ones I highlighted. And then a little later, God pushes back again, and then it says, Moses gets beyond protesting to another P word. Moses pleaded. What does it mean to plead? Please, please. Moses pleaded with the Lord. Oh, Lord, I'm not very good with words. I've never been. And now, and, and not now, even though you've spoken to me, I get tongue-tied, and my words get all tangled up. Anybody here ever notice that I can't read very well? Have you ever noticed that? Anybody here ever notice that I can't read? Anybody here ever notice that? Only a couple of people throwing me in their bus. You'll read the scripture and say, how does he read? Has anybody ever noticed that? Yeah, well, does that stop me? No, so what? Does anybody, is that a problem? You can read the words. Why do I have to read them to you? You can read them for yourself. It doesn't matter. You know what? Same deal with Moses. Moses, but I can't, I can't speak very well. And then, and then, then it goes on. It says, God pushes back. And then Moses again pleaded. He's protesting, 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 and now pleading, pleading. And this time he says, Lord, please. Send anyone else, like anyone. Isn't there like anyone else? That somebody else can do this. See, now whenever I've read this before, or not always, but often when I've read this before and I've used the scripture to speak about it, I, I go off of the idea that he's feeling insecure. There's some element of insecurity, right? I, I'm not a good speaker. I'm not this. I just am not. I'm not. You know what? I don't know if it is insecurity. You know what it is. There's another word for it. It's not insecurity. There's another word. He's making, he's making excuses. Here's the truth. He don't want to do it. What are you going to do when you retire? Anything I want. You going to volunteer? Heck no. Anybody agree with me about that? Yeah, God gave me a thumbs down on that. No, I don't want to volunteer, right? Well, why is it wrong for me? It's not wrong for you. That's not fair. That's not fair. If I have to volunteer, you have to volunteer, right? He's making excuses. And he has, he has excuses. Come on, think about it. His excuses are kind of like ours. Like, I got this settled life. I got a couple of kids, and they're in soccer and dance class. And I got... I, 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 if, if I do this, we're gonna, my kids are going to have to change school districts. That's what Moses is saying. Like, that's the way it's going to be. I, gotta, I live in Midian right now. And, 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 and they're, starting to, they're starting to make friends in Midian school district. And you want me to go back to the Egyptian school system? Like, I don't want, I don't, I don't want to do this, right? He's making excuses. He doesn't want to serve. Do you want to serve? Shh, shh, shh. I'll ask it again. Listen. Do you want to serve? Let me ask it again. You don't have to answer. Do you want to serve? That's a problem. Yes, the right answer. Everybody, you all know the right answer is yes, right? You know that. You, the right, do you want to serve? Yes, that's the right answer. Very good people. Good answer. Good church answer. Do you really want to serve with your kids in soccer? and having to change school districts, and, and having to depart from your settled, comfortable life. Do, do you really want to serve? At your age, don't you agree the younger people should step up here? Seriously. Don't you think they, I let the, I've done it long enough. Don't you agree with that? Actually, yeah. Do you see that anywhere in the scripture? A bunch of years ago, a bunch of years ago, um, our daughter started going somewhere to something called THD. I'll get to that in a minute. There's a guy named Irv Bressler who used to own the Auto Spa and Why I'm Missing. You know, anybody ever see the Auto Spa and I, uh, uh, Why I'm Missing? It's a car uh, detailing business, very good detailing business. It's, the guy that owned that's name is Irv Bressler, and his wife's name is Louise, Irv and Louise. 
And they go to, or went to, I don't know where they go now, but they went to the West Lawn United Methodist Church. And one day they got a new pastor in the church. A new pastor came over to Irv and Louise and said, hey, I got an idea. I got this program. It's an eight-week program. We can, dis- we can mentor a teenager, just one-on-one kind of thing, or two-on-one thing. Just maybe they sat around tables in a room, but you, you take care of your teenager. I'll take care of this. Like, could- would you volunteer and take care of a teenager? You know what Irv's first thought was? They, they, did, they did teach elementary Sunday school at the time. Do, do you know what Irv's first thought was? Would you, would you mentor a teenager? Irv thought, I don't even like teenagers. <laughs> Anybody else don't like it? Don't say you don't like teenagers. That's not right. But Irv said, I don't even like teenagers. But, you know, you know how I can guilt you into things? I, I got the gift. That's one of the requirements of being a pastor. You got to be able to guilt people. So he felt guilty, and he said yes. He said, yeah, I'll, all right, I'll do it. And uh, so he did. And they took care of this first kid, all right? And then that went Okay. That went okay. And then they were assigned another kid. Same eight-week program with the second kid. And then, and then a third kid. And I don't know what all happened. I called Irv up a couple weeks ago when I was writing this to say, hey, to, to fill me in. I don't, we, we only spoke for five minutes, so I don't know all the details, but somehow it began to grow a little bit. And Irv started having teenagers come over. Irv and Louise had teenagers come over to their house on a, Saturday, a Sunday night, 6 o'clock or something like that. And at one point, my, my cousin Pete Bond was going there. He said to my daughter Meredith, our daughter Meredith, hey, Meredith, you ought to come to this. This is pretty good. So Meredith, every Sunday evening, before Meredith could drive, Deanna and I would drive all the way down to West Lawn to Irv's house <coughs> and drop her off, drop her off, and, and then come home, and then go back and pick her up a couple hours later, and then a couple years later, Aaron joined Meredith, and Meredith now driving, and Meredith and Aaron both came down to Herb Bressler's house and, and, and Louise's house, and you know, when we, we dropped her off, we couldn't park outside of Herb Bressler's house. You know why we couldn't park outside his house? There were too many stinking cars there. It got to the point where Herb Bressler had as many as 60 kids in the basement of his house. And he was ministering to them. And he, they came to call it Teens Helping Teens. And I'm sure Irv and Louise sprung for some food. And Teens Helping Teens. And they had this thing every Sunday night. Meredith wouldn't miss it. And it supplemented whatever we were doing in this church. It was just great. And there was teenagers. It wasn't just from the West Lawn United Methodist Church. It was Pete from his church, Meredith from our church. And all these kids from all over the place were coming to Irv Bressel's house and hanging out. I, I still, because I get the clo- some of the clothing I wear is our hand-me-downs from my son. And I have his t-shirt. I still wear Teens Helping Teens t-shirt sometimes because I got it. Because I, you know, they get the clothing and I get the hand-me-downs. But Irv did this. And when I asked Irv about it, Irv said, it was the greatest move of our lives. Now think about that. He has a nice, successful business, the auto spa business, that he started. I think he started that thing. And he said, the greatest move of their lives was starting Teens Helping Teens. Not the auto, not the greatest move of our lives was doing that and saying yes reluctantly to something that they wanted to say no to. Greatest move of our lives is what Eric Ressler said. Greatest move of our lives. The same is true for you. The same is true for you. Like, God wants you to serve. You're called by him to serve. Think about my hand. My hand is supposed to be a a, a hand, right? Think if I have this hand and I never use it as a hand. You come up to me and you want to shake hands, I say, no, I don't, I don't do that. I don't use my hand that way. I, don't, I, don't shake. I mean, think about it. Think about all the things you use your hand for and you've never used your hand for that. I don't know how you brush your teeth. <laughs> you know, it's like, You were meant to serve. My hand was meant to be used as a hand, and you were meant to serve Jesus Christ. And you're meant to serve him throughout the totality of your life. Moses was dragging his feet. Moses was like, he was making all these excuses. 
You know what happened at one point after Moses made one excuse? And that's what it was. It wasn't just insecurity. It was excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse. You know what, what, what happened, what, what we read at some point? Then the Lord became angry with Moses. If you don't serve, do you think the Lord could get angry with you? Or is Moses the only one that God would ever get angry with because of his reluctance to serve? Is it just Moses? Or could it be us? Could it be me? If I retire and say, I'm out of here, that's it. Let the young. Could God become angry with me? Absolutely. Absolutely. God could get angry with me. He could get angry with us. You know what the scripture said? You remember how earlier I was reading from Romans 6, 12, 6. It says, by his grace, he's given us different gifts, and he's given us the gift to prophesy and teach and all those things. Three verses later, three verses later, verse 11, it says this. It says, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. That does not mean we work hard and we're not lazy in our culture when I do my job for which I'm paid. That's not what it's saying. It's saying, in your service of the Lord, you never get lazy and you serve him with what attitude? Enthusiastically. Now, I can't say that Irv was enthusiastic when he started out with the teenager initially. But it was his niche. It was where he belonged. It was a powerful season in his life. He said to me, it's the greatest move I could have ever done. Some of us in this room are getting older, including me, and some of us can say, I'm too old to serve. Let the younger people do it. Let me just call a spade a spade. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's not from the Lord. We're not too old to serve. Serve differently. I'm going to serve differently when I retire than when I'm actively uh, as a pastor in a church. But we are all called to serve. As long as we're sucking air, we got to figure out a way to serve. As a woman, I heard her story, read her story somewhere along the way, just thought of her, I forget her name. She was like 80 years old or whatever, and she was writing to prisoners. She had like a pen pal relationship with inmates, and she just wrote letter after letter after letter. That was her thing. Deanna and I, we're not so good at letter writing. We're almost ready to send out a Christmas letter. So we're not that good. But this other lady, she's, she's much better. She's much better. There's a way for everybody in this room to serve. Now the challenge is figuring out, figuring out what, what it is I'm supposed to do. That's why you have the drive-by shooting. More about that at another time. For now, well, let me just read it this way. In his grace, God has given us, that's all of us, different gifts for doing certain things well. All of us. Let's pray. Lord God, I ask that you would help us to hear you. This part of us is reluctant, and there part of us, we just don't know. We just don't know what we really are supposed to do. But I pray that you would show us, just like I'm trying to figure out, what am I going to do when I retire? We should all be asking a similar question of our own lives. What, do, what are we going to do for Jesus? That's what we should be thinking, and I pray that you would help us to do that. In your name, I ask these things. Amen. The boy took advantage of the time. We're not showing that video. That's too long. Sorry. We're going to sing the next song, whatever it is. What is it? 710. That's what we're going to sing. Ah, there's my bullet. Here we go.
This time, let us express our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Please be seated. Let's pray. Lord God, again, we, we just come before you and ask that you would be at work uh, in the lives of people. I know people that have struggles and difficulties, Lord. I pray that you would be with them in whatever they're going through. I think of Emma Klein's family and ask for your comfort for them in their time of loss. Shocking to me that she died uh, last Sunday. She was just in church last week. And um, shocking certainly for them. And we pray for comfort for them. We pray for comfort for others who are grieving. We pray for those who are struggling in their marriages that you would help them to gain victory and health and goodness and move in the direction you want them to. And we pray, I pray that you would help all of us to truly have a discernment of your spirit's leading, that we would serve you as your son Jesus served. Now hear us as we pray together the prayer that you taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. This time, let's stand and sing our concluding hymn, uh, number 743. one person I want to add to our prayers, and that's Natalie uh, Chappelle, uh, Tony and Lisa's daughter, had a serious surgery in Cleveland. Um, I think it was Thursday of this week. I've been praying for her. And uh, I don't know. It was she, she just has had these 
abdominal problems. And she's 18, 19, 18, 19 years old. Just really difficult uh, stuff. And they took out her large intestines to, to do this, you know, as a part of this. There's a variety of things that were done. And uh, this has gone on for a year or more. Just real challenges physically for her. And I, I'd like to tack on a PS prayer for her and her family because they're still out in Cleveland right now. Lord, we ask that you would be with uh, Natalie and Tony and Lisa and Emily and their family unit, and especially with Natalie, that you would bring healing to her by the power of your Holy Spirit, that this surgery would have been successful and that she would get better. And, and this would uh, usher in a new era of time where she doesn't have the difficulty she had in the past. And the, the solution they've come up with, while maybe making some change, life change for her, will actually uh, get her to a different place. I just pray for them right now. And we thank you for your faithfulness and listening. Because there's a lot of prayers, different ones of us have prayed during the week. And we just thank you for your, your willingness to listen to all of our concerns. In your name I pray. Now may the grace of Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore, world without end. Amen. God's blessing.